Well, hello there, watching the press preview. A first look, of course, at what is on the front pages. Time to see what's making the headlines with the journalist and broadcaster Jenny Kleeman and the political editor of The Scottish Sun, Rachel Watson. Great to see both of you and welcome. So to the front pages then, let us see what is uh, leading them. The Metro has news of the former Health Secretary Matt Hancock's testimony to the COVID inquiry and his assertion that buying body bags was a higher priority for the government than defeating the virus itself. The Express quotes Mr Hancock saying, I want to be brutally honest with the public. The Mirror responds to his appearance with the headline, Sorry is not enough. Meantime, seven days of NHS chaos uh, makes the front of the mail as senior doctors announce another walkout. The Financial Times carries Vladimir Putin's claim that the Kremlin has completely bankrolled the Wagner military, paramilitary group, whose apparent attempt at an uprising against the Russian government at the weekend failed to materialise. The Eye reports that Mr Putin's presidential plane has been used to fly Russian diplomats home from Washington. The Sun is leading with Nicola Bulli's inquest and a text message sent by her partner an hour after she disappeared. The Times warns of an impending 40% hike in water bills as companies grapple with the growing sewage crisis and the effects of climate change. According to The Guardian, the government's own advisers on its net zero strategy have warned it's failing to hit almost all of its targets. And The Star tells us that dogs are no different from humans in that they also need holidays for the sake of their mental health. My director sighed at that, I have to say. But anyway, uh, a reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. Uh, but let's go straight to Jenny Kleeman and Rachel Watson for the first of our stories. Um, and Rachel, why don't you start then? The Metro body bags are higher priority than the virus. You know, everybody very keen to hear what Matt Hancock um, has to say about, you know, the accusation that very many mistakes were made at the beginning and during the pandemic. Yeah, and as you say, it's on a lot of the front pages tomorrow and will dominate vast parts of the inside of papers as well. This is the man that, you know, people have really been waiting to hear from. He was health secretary during the pandemic. Um, and the fact that he was responsible for some of these huge decisions that impacted people's lives that were made, the evidence he gave today is actually really, really stark on the pre-pandemic planning um, that the government had and that they were looking at how to get their hands on body bags and where dead bodies would be buried rather than actually how they could stop the virus spreading. And I think that is such a stark admission from the person who was responsible as health secretary for trying to keep people alive and keep this virus um, from spreading as much as it did. You know, there were families there who lost people. People weren't able to say goodbye to their loved ones. And I think... Um, you know, people will look back on this. And I remember at the time looking at the news in Europe from countries that the COVID pandemic had swept through first, mm -hmm. particularly around care homes, which will be, you know, a big bit when we get to the decision making during the pandemic. But I remember thinking, you know, surely having seen this, the government here will act to make sure this doesn't happen here. And that didn't happen. And we now can see why, because they weren't prioritising trying to stop the spread of the virus, they were thinking how to deal with the consequences. Yeah, the consequences rather than the run in. And that's the difference, isn't it, I suppose? And people, you know, have already heard that, you know, the planning was for a no, a no deal Brexit at the time. There was a slight sense that the Tory party had gone on holiday after January the 31st and, and, the, and China was sort of already dealing it from about mid-Jan. So those run in months are really critical, aren't they? But if our planning was for the consequences, the after effects of a pandemic, then we'd already, the, the premise already was that we were going to get it wrong, Jenny. Yes, although Matt Hancock today said that the planning for the uh, no deal Brexit uh, meant that we were in, in a good place when it came to uh, procure, procuring medicines and, and being independent. I heard things slightly differently from, from, from Rachel. I didn't necessarily think it was a stark admission of any kind of responsibility. I mean, we learned some things, but uh, he effectively said the problem was that he was told a lot of things. And if, if he had anything to apologise for, it was that he didn't 
challenge what he was told. He said he was told we had a significant stockpile of, of PPE. The WHO said that the UK was well prepared for a pandemic. Uh, he was assured that we had the best uh, testing system in the world. So he apologises, but his only error was, was not to interrogate what he, he was told. There's a lot of, of blaming others in what he said. If you actually um, look at the detail, he said when he was appointed the health secretary, uh, he was given every, every assurance necessary. So he didn't take responsibility for anything, really. He blamed the WHO. Uh, he blamed Whitehall, effectively, for, for not giving him information that was right. But he did say um, that in preparing for dealing with bodies, where are bodies going to be buried? Do we have body bags? There wasn't enough focus on, on, on stopping the virus, which is, of course, true, but it's going to be cold comfort to those who lost loved ones. Yes, and certainly during his news conferences, we remember him lamenting that the UK didn't have great diagnostic laboratories like Germany, uh, for example. Um, you know, was he told that people leaving hospital and being sent to care homes were tested on their departure, uh, which is something he also said, which did not happen, as we know, which we saw was part of the issue of those bereaved families who met um, Matt Hancock today and turned their backs on him. You know, a very public statement, Rachel, from them, um, showing their anguish, continuing anguish at what happened in the pandemic. And this is part of the problem for Matt Hancock, isn't it? Yeah, and of course these people don't want to speak to Matt Hancock. I mean, absolutely. You know, people, as I said, people lost loved ones. People couldn't say goodbye to family members. I think we can sometimes, now we've moved so far on from the pandemic, we forget what it was like in lockdown, that people were dying in hospital and people couldn't actually say goodbye to their loved ones. And then you have this health secretary who, as Jenny said, has passed the blame on lots of other people and suggested that, you know, he was told information, which I think we'll hear from a lot of politicians as they go into these hearings over the next while. Um, but these families don't want to hear from a health secretary who is admitting failures, who is at the same time passing blame onto others. And let's not forget who was, you know, pictures splashed all over the papers of him having an affair um, during the, the process. Mm. Yeah, just looking at some of the coverage there, the Daily Express we saw, I want to be brutally honest with the public, the mirror, you know, sorry is not enough, grieving families turning their backs on Hancock as, as he apologises. Um, some suggestion that some of the questioning of him today was overly aggressive and that this should be a lesson learning process. You know, where do you stand on, on, on the, 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 the tone, if you like, of, uh, of the COVID inquiry, Jenny? I think when it comes to Matt Hancock, I think he is desperately insincere and he needs robust questioning. I mean, this is somebody who is presenting himself as somebody uh, who cares um, and who is sorry. But then when you actually interrogate what he's sorry for, it, it, he's not really taking responsibility for anything. He did admit today that the government didn't even know how many people were in care homes, but sort of blamed local government for that. And, you know, this is a man who has undermined his own credibility by, you know, going into the jungle to eat parts of kangaroos with boy George instead of serving his, his constituents. He's not a serious figure. He is a hypocrite. He wasn't prepared to follow the rules that he wanted everyone else to follow. So I think he does need to be questioned in a robust way so that he doesn't use this inquiry as a platform to try and resurrect his public image. Yeah, well, we'll certainly cover um, that um, as it continues. But let's move on to the health service right now, shall we, which is the Daily Mail. Um, seven days of NHS chaos as senior doctors walk out. Um, senior doctors voting in overwhelming numbers to go on strike over pay for the first time in nearly 50 years to put pressure on ministers to reverse the deep cuts they say to their salaries that they've experienced since 2008. We know that uh, junior doctors are already on strike for five days, uh, but now more than 24,000 consultants in England have voted in the BMA ballot, a turnout of 71%, um, Rachel. And uh, the, the problem, I suppose, is that consultants are the people who stand in for junior doctors. Who stands in for the consultants? That's the, uh, the problem for the NHS. Yeah, the mail is doing the seven days of, of NHS chaos. As you say, they're putting together this junior doctor strike with the consultants going on strike as well. And I should say this is in England rather than we're going to have a junior doctor strike in Scotland, um, I think. But this is, you know, slightly different. Um, and yeah, huge numbers of consultants voting for strike. You said there's 24,000 in the ballot, over 20,000 voted. Um, to strike because of this pay dispute. And, you know, we've just been talking about COVID. Um, the people, these junior doctors, consultants who are on the front line throughout this pandemic, who continue to deal with the huge pressures. 
um, that were facing the NHS before the pandemic and since the pandemic with huge backlogs, waiting lists, delays for treatment. Um, and of course, they want fair pay. And when you look at the figures there, I think it's a 35% pay increase in real terms since 2008, 2009, I think the figures were. And, you know, the government really needs to, to get in there and negotiate. And I think that's what the public want. The public want to see the BMA, junior doctors, consultants talking with the government and the two working together to stop this. Because at the end of the day, the public want to know that the NHS is there that their treatment, their tests, everything that they need can be carried out um, in this period of time. And I think, you know, we've just come from last year when there were strikes. Um, Scotland, unlike other parts of the UK, we didn't have strike action over the winter. Um, but parts of the UK, you know, there were strikes all throughout the winter in the NHS and other areas. And the public don't want to be thrown back into a situation where we're looking at public services um, and seeing that. So I think it is, you know, absolutely you know, the government have to get round the table and have to address these concerns that junior doctors and consultants and other people within the NHS have um, and come to a fair solution. Um, just going to divert briefly, if you don't mind. Two of the papers have on their front cover um, issues about water. Uh, the Telegraph, which we'll show you in just a moment, uh, reports um, that the boss of Thames Water has quit as the company races to raise a billion pounds from its shareholders. This is Sarah Bentley. Uh, meantime, our city editor, Mark Kleiman, has breaking news tonight that the government has begun drawing up contingency plans for the collapse of Thames Water. Right, bring us up to date, Mark important news tonight about um, the future of Thames Water, Britain's biggest water company, which serves 15 million customers mm -hmm. in London and the southeast of England. What I've learned tonight is that the government has begun drawing up contingency plans for Thames Water's collapse and the growing doubts in Whitehall about the company's ability to service its £14 billion debt pile. Now, this would obviously be a very important development, and I should point out that at this stage, these are simply contingency plans being discussed uh, within the government that may ultimately not need to be activated off what the water industry regulator is also involved in these talks. But to be clear, and if Thames Water can secure private funding to reduce its borrowings and put itself on a more sustainable financial footing, any form of public ownership would not then be a necessary step. Now, these talks within Whitehall relate to an insolvency process known as a special administration regime, which was used by the government when the energy supplier bulb collapsed back in 2021. And the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Offwat and Thames Water have all been contacted for comment this evening, and their responses, if and when they come, may give us some additional insight into how likely this uh, insolvency process might ultimately be. Now, Thames Water has faced a growing crisis in recent years over its record, record on leaks, sewage contamination, and on issues like executive pay. And as you pointed out there from uh, the papers tomorrow, the uh, company announced on Tuesday that Sarah Bentley, its chief executive for nearly three years, was leaving with immediate effect and that it had begun the search for her successor. And this all comes amid and are a growing debate about the merits of a privatised water industry in Britain, with critics arguing that some form of mutual or public ownership would deliver more reliable services. Ultimately, this is going to be a big political debating point in the run-up to the next general election. Interesting. Mark, thanks very much indeed. And certainly, yes, her picture makes the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Um, Sarah Bentley there pictured, as you can see, uh, on the right-hand side. Um, they also suggest that the water company has faced repeated recriminations over dumping sewage and hosepipe bans, which takes us to the Times as well which suggests that water bills will rise by up to 40% amid a crisis. This is spills and climate change. Uh, they need the extra cash. Um, they say that water companies have been asked to submit investment plans by October to fulfil commitments to tackle pollution from sewage, including improving storm overflows uh, around bathing spots, 
improving 75% of overflows discharging to high priority nature sites. And the suggestion, Jenny, I don't know if you can pick up on this because this is ongoing, uh, this, this sewage overflow issue. Suggestion is that the rises uh, to be announced next year could result in annual bills increasing from an average of about £450 to £680 plus inflation in parts of the country. So if you thought your energy bills were the only things going up, then time to think again. I think we've reached a tipping point, haven't we, when it comes to, to water companies. There was last summer where our beaches were covered in sewage at the same time as bosses were getting record bonuses, at the same time as there were hosepipe bans. We we're already stretched to the limit. With energy bills, at least uh, the energy companies can point to the war in Ukraine to, to justify it, whereas the kind of mismanagement that's that's been at the heart of this is something that people are going to find very, very hard to stomach. And uh, yeah, I, I think we've reached a point where people have had enough with how, how badly run the water companies seem to be. I mean, mismanagement, do you mean in terms of um, not enough storage of water to cope with periods of drought, to, to leaks, as we know, cracked pipes? I mean, what, what are you describing there? That lack of investment in infrastructure at the same time as the bosses are getting enormous bonuses. All of the water company bosses got bonuses last year, and this was a, a year where our beaches were completely blighted with, with sewage, and they were blaming kind of, you know, weather. Um, but these should be things that we can mitigate against. It shouldn't be a fact of life in the 21st century that we're swimming with feces at the same time as, as bosses are getting these payouts. So it's about a, a lack of investment uh, in the infrastructure that we need in order to make the system work properly. Yes, and certainly uh, Sarah Bentley that we discussed uh, was criticised only recently that she'd received pay and perks worth £1.6 million pounds this year, despite the difficulties of sewage outflows and leaky pipes. Rachel, we're running out of time to get to you on that one. Apologies. Mark Kleinman was bringing us that uh, breaking news there that the uh, government has begun to draw up contingency plans for the collapse of Thames water. So uh, breaking news from him. Anyway, plenty more still to come on the press preview, including should we believe Vladimir Putin's claim that the Kremlin has bankrolled the Wagner paramilitary group. Discussing that in just a moment. Well, welcome back. You are watching the press preview with me once again, Jenny Kleeman and Rachel Watson. Welcome back to both of you. Um, extraordinary weekend in terms of news from Russia. Movements today, for example, Yevgeny Prigozhin finally arrived in Belarus. And uh, in the Financial Times, um, their coverage of this picks up on how Wagner was bankrolled and the admission after denials last year that Wagner had been completely financed by the state with $1 billion in payments made in the year from May 2022 and a further, this is in rubles now, 110 billion rubles in insurance payouts. So huge sums Rachel paid to this paramilitary group, which then, as we know, you know, became furious about lack of men, lack of ammunition, lack of respect and attacks by Russian soldiers and um, waged this rebellion at the weekend. Yeah, as you say, the, the movements and the, the changes that happened over the weekend were, were huge and um, really, I mean, for, for most people, it seems to come from nowhere. This just seemed to happen and the... Financial Times today, as you say, or tomorrow's paper, is saying that Putin is admitting that the Kremlin did fund the Wagner Group, finally admitting this after rejecting um, claims previously made about that, though long suspected that the Kremlin had been behind the funding their billions of dollars. So, yeah, there is that now. And as you say, the movements again today, um, the 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 move to Belarus and also the concerns that that's flagged up. There's kind of two sides to this now. If you read some of the coverage in the papers, there's one side where you have people talking about what does this actually mean for Vladimir Putin, the fact that he faced this rebellion, um, the Kremlin desperately trying to say that this isn't him losing his grip on power, um, and that that this you know they have overcome this. This will not be the kind of first of many um, attempts to take power from him in Russia but also fears from countries surrounding Belarus with the Wagner Group moving there um, and concerns from places like Poland, Lithuania and Latvia around what this could mean for them. Also, Belarus, again, on another side of Ukraine, 
Um, what could this mean for the war effort? So again, we're in this very shaky situation, this position where we don't... Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.